switching to using a different tool altogether. Um, well, we, we've got a bunch of internal tooling that you'd think would make sense to, to do that kind of thing with, but it turns out that making a general purpose one isn't what happens when a company makes one for themselves. Um, I'm curious because... um. Even though Atlassian has been rather reticent to offer Linden Lab an open source um, project or cloud server, they do have an open source contract. Um, is that something that Firestorm or anyone else has used? Yeah, do, they, do they say no or? Okay. But it's just you get you still have to self-host it. Okay. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Really, that they seem to really want to follow a per user pricing model. Yeah, I know one of the, the things that's in the running is GitHub issues. Um, but I don't know if that's practical for our use case or if anybody has experience with it and might have thoughts on that. Yeah, that sounds about right. Even though GitHub has been doing a bunch of work with their new projects um, feature, it doesn't have the kind of customizable workflow that Jira does. So they're adding features pretty quickly. Yeah, so that might be the good netizen thing to do is just help GitHub get there. Oh, one benefit of GitHub issues is it is free. Has anyone looked at software specifically targeted at, um, you know, kind of external bug reporting, um, you know, support tickets rather than all of the, you know, internal stuff that we that we currently use Jira for? Yeah, I know once upon a time we used Bugzilla, and there's a reason we stopped. So, Kitty, you're saying people just submit a uh, submit a form, and then you handle the converting it to an internal Jira part, so they don't need to actually have a Jira account to do that.
Yep, makes sense. So does that give them any ability to kind of follow up, see see the state of existing tickets or see what other tickets are out there or or is it just purely kind of a one way trap that they can they can kind of uh, you know, drop their drop their issue into? There's one called email me form, we use that, um, and that could be configured to send responses, etc. But I, I don't know if it would be any use to you guys, I'll send you a link for it. I don't know how you mean you'd have to really customize that yourself. No, oh, thanks. We should uh, take a look at that. Yeah, bug splat is pretty great for crash reports. Can't we get a free version of bug splat? How do I do that, Worley? If it's free, I'll have two. You did, didn't you? Sorry. Oh, you did, sorry. Uh, Rod, use that internally or for public bug reports or both? Yeah, I'm not sure Atlassian is on our current shopping list. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'll get Twitter the bags first. for money. Seems to be all the rage. Yeah, my, my inclination is that everything's on the table right now, um, and we are getting on it early enough that we'll have enough time to really make a good, informed decision so it's not an emergency. We have until the uh, beginning of 24... But, you know, our JIRA is, whether we like it or not, one of our best sources of documentation. So we really need to consider how to preserve that and make it sure it's still searchable. And... Yeah, getting transitioned over is going to take a fair amount of work. So it's not just uh, it's not just the time to choose our products. But, yeah, we've got a we do have a ton of uh, kind of. Uh, uh, I don't know, technical lore and uh, accumulated knowledge and wisdom in our Jira's currently. We can't can't afford to lose all of that. Yeah. Thinking of all the times I've done a commit message and thought, oh, I'll put the details in the Jira comment. Should have put those details in the commit message. Uh, really, I don't think we've ruled out anything yet. It's, uh, uh, it's, you know, we're, we'll, we're willing to look into any option that seems viable. What, what doesn't seem to be viable now is allowing every Second Life user to have a Jira account. It's just too, uh, too pricey. Yeah, what we end up with could look like something like uh, we keep our internal JIRA um, for historical reasons, but switch to GitHub issues for everything else. It could look like something besides GitHub issues. It could look like we use GitHub issues for a replacement for the public JIRA and keep using like JIRA Cloud internally. But yeah, the, the thing that we know that we can't do is um, keep using Jira for public bug reports that people can comment on. And that's really important. So whatever bug tracking system we come up with, residents need to be able to comment on their bug reports. Well, we hope we won't lose data, but at this point, you know, we don't even know what we're going to be doing. So it's, uh, it's all unfortunately kind of TBD. The things that are accepted and waiting in the queue could potentially vanish. Oh, well, that's something, isn't it, Whirly? If it's still there, you can still see it.
Yeah, I don't know if we'd have the option to just leave it online as a kind of a read-only archive or something. The issue is security updates, and if it's not being updated, it's not receiving security updates. Mm, true. Yeah, so then there would be some vulnerability, and we'd be obligated to shut it down. You become the we could charge for bots to run ads on it. I'm reliably informed that you can integrate emails into Jira tickets so it can read emails and transform them into tickets. So presumably you could get like an anonymous poster on there, but a form to say what their Second Life account is. Would that work? Uh, Harley, what scaling issues did you run into with that? Yeah, I mean, based on what we know now, I, I really can't promise that we're going to find a solution that has all of the good features of the existing system. But, um, well, you know, we're, we're doing our best. We're looking into it. May I ask my DAF question of the week, please? No. I need to know the mechanics behind something. Active speaker list, people who are talking. Got problems with the updating sometimes. And if you disconnect from voice and then reconnect from voice, that is a much slower process than if you were to use the hack, which is to go into preview voice morphing and then come out of it again. What is the difference between the two? Because both disconnect you from voice and reconnect you, but one is quicker than the other. I haven't a clue. Um, yeah, don't uh, I don't know, but it's a it's a fair question. Um, can take a look and maybe uh, see what's going on under the hood with with Vivox. Yeah, I don't I don't know with, without absolute certainty, but is the difference the difference between disconnecting from SL voice and reconnecting entirely, and just joining a new room on the Vivex? Vivox backend, like is the you're just changing from current parcel voice to the preview um, for voice morph in the back. So we're working on a refresh, and it seems that whatever the method is to go into preview voice morphing, but not actually going as far as previewing it, just getting yourself set up to preview it and then coming back out of it is a much quicker refresh. Yeah, I don't, I don't know with certainty, but it uh, it does take a long time to establish a totally new voice session uh, compared to just joining a new channel. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's not such a daft question after all. I'm I'm going to go the route of going into the voice morphing thing to do a refresh because it seems quicker. Uh, I'm kind of curious. What what was the uh, the reason for wanting to refresh in the first place? Because sometimes the names don't populate correctly. If you TP to another place, um, you may not get everybody who's actually actively talking. You can hear them, but their name might not populate. So it might be a problem in that as well, in the actual active speakers. Do we have a Jira for that? Or is that just in the Genesis viewer? Um, it's an inherited bug. Um, yeah, if it's so, an issue that, that repros on, on our viewer, then uh, the easiest way to get us to like dig into it would be to file a JIRA. It's not just on Genesis. Well, you still can. My previous viewer as well. Um, it, it, it's like It's like you have to reset voice. But there's two ways of doing it. You can go in and turn off voice and ref wait for it to completely refresh and turn it back on. Or you can go in and you can turn on preview voice morphing, wait for it to reset and turn off voice morphing and you, you got voice back on. So there's two ways of doing it, but the resetting the voice morphing seems to be faster than the resetting the voice. Yeah, seems like figuring out which one of those is faster is the wrong thing to look at. Like, let's figure out why you'd want to have to restart it in the first place and make that, you know, fix yeah, the bug. It's for sure. Fix the bug, not the workaround. Right, true. It's for sure a, a bug. Right, it, it's happened. It, it was with my previous viewer as well. I, I don't know about the Second Life viewer. I don't use the, the um, I don't use the Second Life viewer, I'm sorry, but I, I know that it was with my previous viewer as well. The bug isn't how to fix it. The bug is is that your voice doesn't um, populate. Like you might only have one person on your voice channel, and you hear nobody else. Or you you it may show that you're on a voice, but nobody else is showing up on voice. And this is this is this is not. I'm telling you, this is not new to my issue. Yeah, I mean, ideally, if, if that is something that repros on our viewer, then we would just try to tackle it, uh, you know, as, as Dave says, fix the bug, not the workaround. Fix it, don't hack it. I, I will I will have a go on your viewer and see if I can break it.
Oh, all right. I didn't ask if there was anything in the simulator news department. It's going to be pretty quiet till after uh, uh, till after the holiday. We do have one uh, one simulator right now in RC that has a single, ironically enough, uh, Vivox fix where it was it was. Uh, leaking some resources so that will be uh, that will go out just before the uh that will go out the tuesday before uh before thanksgiving um and but other than that it's a little it's it's uh pretty quiet uh yes actually really that is Yeah, we definitely aspire to have a quiet week next week. I'd have to go searching for my tabs, really. Uh, I remember that SL birthday thing coming up before, but I don't remember what the consensus was. Did we decide that was a time zone issue or something else? Mortal Rider, I can't see that. Oh, I'll po I shall poke around for it. Uh, uh, the one, the, but yes, the uh, the one that uh, that that Whirly posted there is the is the right one. Got it. Thank you. Duplicates. an interesting one. I should follow that. On the subject of uh, mere mortal can't see it. Um, I know it, 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 it's kind of like this bothersome thing that there's this privacy wall. Um, and that it seems like transparency would be better. Um, but the primary motivation for the divide, uh, is so that we don't accidentally, um, leak information about other residents, uh, because we end up with a lot of private information 
or you know people talking oh, to us I, about I completely agree with you I post a lot of things private because I have elevated rights in there but there's all kinds of things I don't pre particularly want uh, everyone else to see so yeah good idea yeah Usually, Wordy goes in and corrects what I've done. <laughs> so it's always handy. Yeah, and that gets tricky. Um, like, I know it's happened at least once where I, I personally have commented something publicly and a bug that was embarrassing for somebody um, that they had uh, shared privately to help reproduce a bug. So having a chasm <laughs> helps keep that from happening. Yeah, having a mechanism for, you know, everything is public unless somebody remembers to flag it as private is uh, not much better than everything being public. It's, uh, you know, because people are always going to screw that up. Yeah, I'm waiting for that to happen when you switch to GitHub. <laughs> A whole new set of privacy flags to learn. There was actually a time when we had a bunch of our internal JIRAs in a public state, and it uh, it led to some interesting issues because we we're using it for we're using JIRA for project management. So it's like you know, um, you know, oh, we're gonna move this JIRA from you know Sprint One to Sprint Three, or we've changed the you know priority relative to the other stuff. But it was almost like internal bookkeeping junk. And people would like see this and they'd get all excited about it. Like, ah, oh, why have you moved it to a different sprint? <laughs> it was, it was uh, not, not particularly helpful. You know, they didn't really have the context to understand what was going on. So um, it was just generating kind of noise. Oh yeah, server logs are super fun. Yeah, our login volume is fantastic. When I was, when I was working on the server side, logs uh more than once i got lost uh because you'd come across some some uh end world game where uh it was like a choose your own adventure text game and you'd start reading the story that was showing up in the log and be like wait i want to see what happens next
Oh yeah, that one. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think Beck absolutely has the right idea there, and I'm pretty sure that that blog post is an accurate description of what the current behavior is. That behavior wasn't designed to behave that way, but if people are happy with that behavior and it, and it is the current behavior, um, then what we should do is document that as expected and maintain it. Um, What I don't like about what's there so far, though, is that there's there's a bit of this like hand wavy stuff around the root perm being being transparent. Um, and what I think would make more sense is if we had it well defined, all the way down to the face level, because um, it looks like it's well defined now at the attachment point level. So like what your attachment point index is, uh, according to that that table. That, that's listed in that blog post. Um, like that, that's well defined, and that's something that we can maintain. Um, but then you get this like undefined behavior for uh, what happens lower than the attachment point level. So, what order does the link set get rendered in? What order do the faces get rendered in? Um, so what I'd like to do is define it as um, what's there with the attachment point, but then also uh, like the root prim is rendered before child prim one is rendered before child prim two, and then for each prim face zero is rendered before face one is rendered before face two, and just explicitly call that out as this is how it is, this is how it's always going to be. And specifically, this would only apply to um, rigged attachments that have alpha blending. Does that assume that everything is in the same batch, or does it still work if stuff winds up in different batches? And we just have to make it so that that order preempts the batch building. Um, For most cases, that wouldn't actually break batches. It would just change the order that the face shows up in the batch. Like you can still render all the faces for a collection of objects in one draw call, um, and you can bake that order into the vertex buffer. Um, so just because the, the order is guaranteed doesn't mean that you have to have a separate draw call for each face. Hi, Beck. Yep. So just catching up on your blog post um, and talking about codifying that into the documentation somewhere as something that is official and supported. And I, I don't want to say by design because it's not, it, it emerged. Um, <laughs> but is the design. <laughs> Uh, and I was saying that the uh, 
Right, and and even if there are edge cases that break the attachment point uh, behavior that that's described in the blog, I think that we should treat those as bugs and make them respect that order. And Becca was saying that uh, I'd like to take it a step further and define a rule that says uh, once you get into the order of rendering rigged meshes that are on a particular attachment point, if, the, if it's a link set of rigged meshes, then it would be root prim gets rendered first, child prim one gets rendered on top of that, child prim two gets rendered on top of that, and then within each uh, object, uh, phase zero gets rendered, then phase one gets rendered on top of that, phase two gets rendered on top of that. Um, that way it's always consistent. There's no undefined behavior. And it's something that we can probably maintain. Right, and if and when we create a system that allows you to explicitly set like object or face draw order, um, that wouldn't conflict with this behavior. This behavior would just seed that system. Like you'd, you'd infer what the draw order is if it hadn't already been explicitly declared. So that would be the ideal. Um, start enforcing this behavior now and content that is broken in places where this behavior is being observed by the viewer, the content's wrong. If the content's broken and the viewer isn't observing this behavior, then the viewer's wrong. Um, and then to really flush out the feature, provide an ability to any UI to uh, let people just move things up and down in a stack so that they can control what's on top of what. Yeah, and, and a lot of that will probably change uh, if and when we do GLTF mesh import. Not the in-world behavior, but the import behavior. The whole point would be to not change the in-world behavior. I don't know that you can change link order. Um, and it's consistent. Although I should double check Ryder. <laughs> is Ryder still here? Um, Link order is consistent, right? Like. Yeah, yeah, that does not. Uh, yes, until uh, until you relink something, it's not going to go changing what your what your uh, uh, what your link order is. Right, so, and there's no UI for changing the link order right now, right? You just have to like unlink it and then select things in the order that you want them to be linked. Uh, in the reverse order, but yeah. Right. So that's the kind of thing that'd be nice to have a UI for. Um, And maybe even reordering faces, but that gets a little less clear. Uh, 
Uh, Dave, where we had a couple of questions about PBR viewer in uh, chat here. Uh, yeah, the fast timers are deprecated. That's that's answer number one. The fast timers turn out to not be fast, and we're moving away from the fast timer view entirely and shifting towards Tracy. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I, I, I remove them when I'm bored. Um, but there are a lot of them. And some of them are used for um, more than just the fast timers. So you can't just go in and nuke all of them. Uh, what was number two, the texture console? It is not expected that bias is always at five. Um, it might be, it might always be at five if you don't have much video memory. Um, so the real question there is, um, how do the textures look? Because bias at five just means that it's trying to, um, down res things. But the behavior on down resing is no longer like down res everything. Um. It's it, it favors down resing things in the background first now. So you should see overall sharper textures than you do on the release viewer, even if your bias is always at five. Right, and Beck, when when you compile out the fast timers, certain statistics quit working. Um, can't think of one off the top of my head, but, uh, yeah, I like the statistics floater, it pulls data from, uh, L trace. And the rook, the block timers feed into LL trace. And Worley, yes, please do file a bug. Uh, if it's if you're getting blurrier textures, then we'll need to find a way to reproduce that locally. I just had a fun back and forth with Ansario about uh, the line thickness and Firestorm. Um, which turned out to be a misreading of the GL 4.6 spec. It is not normal for them to flash to gray rapidly. I have not seen that. I did see stuff flashing to gray rapidly because of another bug, um, but it wasn't related to uh, running out of video memory.
Yeah, that looks like a different bug. Uh, I'm not 100% sure that that one's related to uh, video memory. Alright, I'm just popping in with the usual end of meeting time notice. Um, as usual, feel free to stick around. And anybody who's not sticking around, have a good weekend and uh, good holiday if applicable. Thank you for a very informative meeting and see you next time and have a, a lovely Thanksgiving. We don't get Thanksgiving, we just get Black Friday. But Black Friday is the worst part of Thanksgiving. Precisely. Thank you for airing my point. I was, I was <laughs> have picturing a good time. people in England just celebrating getting rid of all the Puritans, but maybe not. Well, we... Black Friday is kind of new here, so we have people who will punch each other out for a loaf of bread. You know what I mean? It's really sort of tiny stuff. It's horrible. Ha <laughs> ha, first time? About five years, I think. It's 10 p.m. all down the pub. See you later, guys. No, uh, and, heck. <laughs> and Worley, please do file a gear for that one and include a slur to that that place. That looks like a much more fun texture test than one that I've been using, which is just a bunch of numbers on pictures. Sweet, thank you much. Oh, and is it actually moderate, or is it uh, are a lot of the pictures less moderate? Yay! Thank you very much. I'll get on that. <laughs> okay. Woo. No, I said woo.